My guest this week is a dame, Dame Sarah Story, a woman who is not only Britain's most famous Paralympian, but a national hero who has won our hearts with her show-stopping performances at the Paralympic Games around the world. I actually just couldn't get over, you know, I felt slightly inadequate when I started the podcast and that just grew throughout. I mean, I jest there because actually it has made me realise what hard work does and what you can achieve. And it's really listening to her understanding of getting through the psychology that you need to embrace as you navigate the challenges that she has faced throughout this lifetime of a journey. You know, it all started when she was 14 years old, winning medals. And she has such grace and poise and her spirit, it's like a beacon. And so Sarah embodies what is to be a true role model for our children, for girls, having that conversation about endless potential and endless possibilities, no matter who you are, what life has served you, and how to harness the impossible. You're going to want to get on a bike. That's all I can say after this podcast. Enjoy. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down. Where we're going, you won't need to bring your frown. Hi, I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to my podcast, Conversations of Inspiration. I founded my first business, Not on the High Street, at 28, with a newborn strapped to my chest. Nearly 20 years on, he's all grown up and I'm running my second business, Holly & Co. I've learnt so much about taking risks, running a business and some extraordinary life lessons along the way, and I know others have too. Yet despite the wealth of experience we have between us, lessons like this are often left unheard, and it can feel like we're travelling our paths alone. So I've reached out to founders and those who simply inspire me to share their hard-earned wisdom with you. My hope is that collectively, these remarkable realisations will help you on your own journey. I like to think of it as inspiration for life. If you enjoyed this episode, might I ask you to share it with a friend and to like, subscribe and review it so that together we can ignite people's passion across the UK. Now, let's begin this week's Conversation of Inspiration. Hello, Sarah. Welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Oh, thank you, Holly. It's great to be here. Now, tell me, where are you? I'm out in Lanzarote. I've been here for a couple of weeks doing my final big camp of the winter, uh, escaping the wet of the UK and just trying to get that final uh, big block of training in uh, before the race season starts at the end of March. I can say you are glowing. (laughs) <laughs> um, and it is absolutely pissing rain down here. So you're you're not missing much. I know you need no introduction, but let me just say that you are the most successful British Paralympian of all time, a true champion on and off the track, as well as winning. And I just cannot even cope with this. 28 medals and 29 world championships and you've also won the heart of the nation so it's not bad and I mean you started this so early so I can't I I just I have to get into your story but you are a a wife a mum of two gorgeous children and a woman for all of us women to hold in such high regard and I'm so thrilled to be talking to you today how has 2024 been so far for you the training, getting yourself ready. What's that? You've got blue skies in the sun. Okay, fine. But what's the rest of the time been like? Well, 24 has been great so far, touch wood. Um, I finished my second camp on New Year's Day and came home to the first half term of the spring term. And then it's in term time, it's a juggle between work, training, children's activities. Um, and then in the holidays, I, I've taken a slightly extended um, half term and the kids joined me for their half term to do my final camp. But it's been good so far and it's just about plotting the path now towards the games at the uh, beginning of September and um, just choosing the races, looking back at previous data and making informed choices and then lining up the equipment that I'm going to use. Um, so some of that time is spent in the wind tunnel to decide on the, the skin suit that I'm going to ride 
and other bits is just making sure that I've got the right number of spares because you can never account for everything that might happen in a bike race. Sometimes nothing goes wrong. Sometimes everything goes wrong. Oh, so you've just got to prepare. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> and we were going to talk about more about what you're training for, um, obviously, um, later on. But let me get into your childhood because you were born in Cheshire and you were the eldest of three children and you were born um, without a functioning left hand. And I read that this was because your arm became entangled in the umbilical cord whilst you were in the womb. And when you were born, your grandmother, who is at the time worked in disability services, was the first to say that people would hardly notice it and that your life wouldn't be diminished as a result. Obviously a very wise woman. Do you remember feeling any different as a young child and did it stop you doing anything? No, I mean, we... we there was a newspaper that said it got caught in the umbilical cord. We really just don't know. And I think that was the point. Nobody knew and nobody needed to know. And that yep. was the sort of path towards me just carrying on as normal. There didn't need to be any special concessions. I had a few different gadgets, I suppose you could call them. We called them gadgets when I was a kid that helped me to do things with two hands, to learn to hold a knife and fork uh, with two hands and to learn to skip. Um, to learn to play table tennis. So I was a table tennis county champion and the rules required me to throw the ball up with the opposite hand to where I was holding the bat. So there was things that we made adjustments for, but there was never a point where anybody decided to treat me any differently. And if they did, they got short shrift from me. <laughs> um, and I just carried on. And I was on the county netball team. I was the safest pair of hands on court um, because I was good at catching with one hand. And that was useful for the lobs behind you when you were trying to, to get away from the defenders. I was a goal attack. But yeah, just just carried on. And my grandma had this different perspective because she was working with people who were profoundly uh, challenged with uh, mental health capacity and learning disabilities and also profound physical disabilities and combinations of all of those. And so she was working with families to try and navigate, you know, a path that would help them to um, bring out the best in the child who was obviously struggling to engage. And yes. she said to my mum, you know, there are families who would love their children to make the mess that yours are making. So don't don't even worry about it because some children were um, on twenty four seven care to, to make sure that they right. you know were kept alive. So it was it was a perspective that meant that yeah you're fine. Just carry on. <laughs> what a unique, by the way, perspective though to have that at that point in time. What a a lucky sort of mm. set of circumstances in a way that she did have that perspective. And I know that it was a very outdoorsy childhood. And am I right in saying that your parents were scout leaders and mm. you were uh, off to camps and yeah. it was it was a very sort of sporty upbringing and that swimming became part of your childhood from a very, very young age. And you were the fastest swimmer in your school by the time you were eight. Yeah. Now, my niece is eight <laughs> and sh she's really quite little yeah. still. So I I'm just picturing you as the fastest person in your school. Tell me about how swimming became part of your life. Yeah, no, I was very tall. So I was five foot five when I left uh, primary school. So I was tall even from being, you know, young. And it was born out of tragedy, unfortunately. Uh, our village is a canal running through it. And one of the pupils at my school, prior to me being born, had drowned in the canal. And he was honoured, his legacy was honoured with what the, with the Carl Bailey Cup. Now, I was a Bailey before I married a story and everyone assumed he was a relative and he wasn't. But we all felt sort of very deeply about this tragedy that sort of hit the village. And in response to the tragedy, the parents of the school set up a school swimming club, which is still sadly not running anymore. And it was quite unusual for a village primary school to have a, its own swimming club. But we all went to the next village where there was a swimming pool, 25 metres, four lanes. And there was a lady, one of my friend's mums, who was a swimming teacher. And every Saturday in term time, that's what we did. We went to the pool and depending on how good you were, you were in different groups and different other people volunteered to help. And every the, the target was that every child in the school learned to swim before they went into year six. So that by the time they went to high school in year seven, then they were competent. And as part of that sort of pathway every year, I think it was in the, the start of the summer term, we had a school gala that compete and you competed for the Carl Bailey Cup. And the person in the school who swam the three lengths of the backstroke, breaststroke, front crawl, the fastest, 
they won the Carl Bailey Cup and I did that on three consecutive years in year four, year five and year six. It's it, it's actually quite incredible because, you know, we, we talk on this podcast a lot about children finding their diamond and what makes them jump out of bed. You know, my mum actually calls it peacock feathers. Mm-hmm. You know, what is that thing that a kid who's dealing with all their insecurities and growing up and finding their place in the world and then what puts a smile on their face? And this is obvious that there was something happening here, you know, and I, I'm wondering if everybody around you was thinking, oh, she'll still grow up to be a nurse or <laughs> I, I, don't, yeah. I don't know if it, you, do you know what I mean, like but they're not really thinking, oh, this is not really a career that's going to happen here. But you obviously had that uh, swimming success that led to your swimming training becoming more formal and you flew through all the training groups and that it wasn't until you were about 12 that you realised that you had a bit of a disadvantage. And this must have been frustrating to you, but also at the same time, you became aware of the Paralympics. Can you do me the honour of sort of telling me about that sort of uh, discovering that? Yeah. I listened to actually um, Melinda Gates the other day and we all think that she's probably a feminist and she said she didn't become a feminist until she was 40. You know, we discover things, don't we, at different times where people expect you to know these things. Um, but for whatever reason in our lives, we can discover things at different points. No, you're absolutely right. And for me, I'd seen the Olympic Games on TV. I'd watched my very first games in 1984 as a six-year-old and I just wanted to be a British athlete. So the sort of background to me being the fastest swimmer in the school that was that I was just obsessed with the Olympics and trying to get there myself. And I was prepared to do every sport as fast as possible to see which one worked first. And it was when I started high school and then I started training and I was not quite there. I was just about keeping up. I was just about good enough, but I never made the national qualifying times for um, British swimming to go to the national uh, junior championships and the national age groups. And I was just like, oh, this is really annoying. Like, I really want to do this. And I saw a news programme about a, a young lady with one arm who was preparing for the Paralympic Games in Barcelona and I asked my coach who himself was a, a deaf Olympian and he'd competed for Great Britain I said also well, can you explain what that means you know what, what's she doing what's the Paralympics and and so he explained to me and he said you know if, if you're interested to find out whether you have uh, you, you can be classified we'll, we can work it out and so I wrote a letter to the lady who coordinated um, the Northwest squad and that's how it was organised in those days and he said if you you can compete in the regional competitions and get classified, then you'll go to nationals and then you'll see how good you are compared to the rest of the swimmers in the UK. And that lady didn't reply to me for 18 months. No. Because I just assumed that I wasn't good enough because she hadn't replied. And when she finally replied, she said, oh, you look like you might be quite quick. Come to the gala. It's in three weeks. So I just turned up to this competition. It was a competition of sorts, but in those days, they organised Paralympic sports according to disability groups. So you had people with different disabilities sort of collectively training together, and then they were nominating through to the British Paralympic Association. And at this particular event, the vast majority of the people there used swimming as a form of rehabilitation and and sort of um, physio for the condition that they were living with. And so it meant that most of them weren't competitive. They were recreational swimmers. And I felt really out of place. I lapped people in four lap races. And there was one lady there um, called Trina Curran and she, her, her husband was competing in the bowls events um, so he wasn't swimming. And she said, Sarah, you don't need to worry. This is a collective group of every aspect of para swimming you could imagine. And she said, you're the very elite end. So she sent me to a training weekend. And at the training weekend, it was November 1991. And this is where I was signed up to the British swim team. The training weekend was all of the people in the UK together. And they put me in lane six to start the session on the first morning. And by the end of the first half hour, I was leading lane one ahead of all the boys. And uh, she, they were like, oh, where did this girl come from? And um, I just like, I just wanted to prove that I was good enough and I was more than good enough. You know, I was signed up on the spot, if you like. Oh, my goodness. And they, they'd been sitting on this talent for for so long, so to speak. And I'm wondering if you can tell me, because you, you this journey from that 12-year-old girl who had never heard of the Paralympics 
to the 14-year-old who exploded onto the swimming scene at the Barcelona 1992 Games, winning five medals, including two golds. Six medals. <laughs> Let's just go back to what a 14-year-old is. You hadn't even taken your GCSEs. No. This is just absolutely insane. Yeah, I've got friends with children who are approaching the end of their year nine, which is where I was. And two golds, three silvers and a bronze. So uh, six medals, sorry. Yeah, six. And it, for me, it just was like another competition. I'd gone in there and I'd had the advice of, he's now Lord Holmes and uh, Baroness Grey Thompson. They were two teammates of mine who um, took me under their wing and they said, treat it like any other competition. Just go out there and just perform and don't think about yeah. you know the consequences it almost and I just thrived in the idea that there was a person in the in the races I was competing in who'd never been beaten and that was like you know red rag to a ball I was like never been beaten well let's find out what I can do <laughs> and it was like this fun you know just this enormous amount of fun to just see how good I could be uh, and it was just born out of a curiosity to see how fast you can go. Do you remember what it felt like? Because, I mean, I, I'm, I'm finding your memory incredible, by the way. I can't remember, you know, last week. You remember the lanes that you were in yeah. uh, when you were 12 <laughs> years old. Um, so I'm, I'm finding, I'm feeling already inadequate. I was feeling inadequate before even getting on with you. At a 14-year-old, you'd achieved your dreams on the world stage to be Britain's youngest gold medalist at the time. How did that feel? Or did you literally take it that was a competition and I won it and now I'm just going to get back, do you know what I mean, to having fun with my friends and cracking onto the next thing and doing my GCSEs? Or did you sort of know something was brewing within you? Well, when I got the taste of the sort of the game's life, if you like, you go into this the, the the village, you know, the, the everything's everything's laid on. You know, you go to the food hall, you can choose. There's a, a the, there's a huge amount of discipline required in a village because everything you could ever need and more is there. So it's the best place and the worst place depending on your personality. And and I really thrived in this uh, the, under this idea that you have to make the right choices because what you choose to eat now or what you choose to do in the village today will impact. And will have um, mm. an effect on how you train or compete. Uh, and, and we were there for three weeks. And so we had a, a build up to the opening ceremony. And then we started competing the day after. So you had to make good choices. And, you know, straight up, I didn't make the right choices every day. But I was learning fast and I learned how to prioritize things. And I really enjoyed that environment. And I thrived in that sort of pressure. Uh, and I wanted to basically compete for Britain as for as long as possible. I came away from the games thinking, I want to do this for the rest of my life. So I just set myself up yeah. with a target that I still haven't seen through yet because I am still doing it. But it also, <laughs> I just I just loved the idea that, that it was that curiosity of not knowing how, how good I could be. And yes, I'd proved I could win six medals and become a double champion, two world records. But Equally as an athlete, there's this mentality and you're surrounded by other people with a similar mentality is, well, what happens when I try again? Will I go faster? Yeah. Can I do more? And it's almost like this insatiable desire to keep pushing boundaries and to keep challenging yourself. And so yeah. one thing I didn't do in Barcelona, which I made sure I did do after the subsequent games, is to enjoy that moment more. Because I remember feeling so excited by what I'd achieved, but completely undervaluing it at the same time yeah so f as kids do you're so quick to move on yeah grow up move on do the next thing I remember it feeling so amazing and it's only now I reflect back and think wow <laughs> you know that was really cool I should have thought about that more at the time <laughs> how old are your kids so Louisa's 10 she's gonna be 11 in June and Charlie's nearly six and a half so very much living the idea of that moving things too quickly not trying to get them to like appreciate the moment. It almost sounds like the village, you found your flock. You sort of found where you wanted to be in the world. And then it was pretty unbelievable to think that you returned to school after this all and your GCSEs because, of course, you you were 14. But your success meant that school became a bit of a battleground and there was a lot of jealousy and rejection from school friends, which 
She slightly can understand. I mean, you never understand that whole, that's just a hard age, isn't it? That that middle bit. (laughs) And it must have been very isolating for you to have tasted where you knew you should be, but to almost be put back into the world. And am I right in saying that uh, an eating disorder resulted in this stress? How did you navigate all of this? So when I came back, the school said, you bring your medals in have a day where people see them and you go around and show them and then take them home and don't bring them back and don't talk about it. And that was questionable advice. I remember telling Judy Murray about it and her being horrified. Mm. Um, and I think there should have been a middle ground potentially. And it, it, you know, I'm not blaming school by any stretch. They were trying to do the best for me so I could concentrate. And I always knew I needed a backup plan. I needed an education. Sport is not a profession. Yeah. Always. It it doesn't necessarily pay the bills always. You know, it's, it's something you need another string to your bow. So I knew I needed to study and they wanted to protect me and make sure I had no distractions. And I already had enough distractions because I had lots of competitions and training weekends and events to go to. So even without the medals that were at home, there was lots of things keeping me away from school. I think I averaged four days a week for the entire final two years. So my attendance was appalling, but my results were exceptional because I worked incredibly hard in the days when I wasn't at school to keep up. Yeah. I was the SWAT because I was never behind with anything. I was on top of everything. So I had a work ethic that was unrivaled and nobody could keep up with both sides, whereas I was quite happy to keep up because I knew I needed both to work, to sort of see through my ambitions of taking my career into adulthood. Mm. And so I was, you know, the walking conversation stopper. The girls weren't that pleased to see me. Yeah, I was never available for sleepovers or weekends of whatever it was that they were doing. And I was always away. I was very rarely there on, you know, like I say, four days a week. I read that you said comes to school with wet hair. Yeah. Who does she think she is? She never talks about what she's doing. She's never available at weekends. She's always rushing off after school. She's gone running at lunchtime. I, I see what you mean about the school and whether hiding all of this success or dedication. I mean, maybe today we would be... Explaining perhaps. Yeah, we would be putting you in assembly and and telling everyone to root you know, get behind you and how proud the whole school was of you. And and they were, they were really proud. And I I didn't think they explained what training meant. You know, I was training at lunchtime. That was the running, you know, swimming is a a non-impact sport. So as a growing up girl, you need to do your impact training. You need to do your strength and conditioning both in and out of the water. So I was very much doing that. And I think, just being sporty was already singling me out, but being sporty with a very elite training program made me like an alien, I guess. Yeah. I had no choice but to arrive with wet hair, otherwise I had to get out the pool early. And one thing that used to really rile the coaches was when people had to get out for school at half past seven. We'd start training at half past five and we'd train till eight o'clock. And people started getting out at seven and then half seven. And those of us that were the most dedicated, in the words of the coach, would stay till eight. So I used to go, oh, I'm the most dedicated. I'm staying till eight. I'm getting all the work in I can. Um, And so I'd literally just run out of the pool, get dry and run and get in the car. So drying the hair was no option. Um, It was a choice between, yeah, having dry hair or having more training. And I always opted for more training. One of the things I'm most proud of at Holly & Co is the fact that over 90% of the small businesses that sell on our marketplace are female founded. It means that every time you shop with us, you are voting with your money for the kind of world you want to live in. By supporting women-owned businesses, you're backing the idea of flexible working, showing the next generation what's possible and actively championing the female economy. It means that despite only two pence of every pound's worth of funding in the UK going to women, and women still being the primary caregivers, we are rising above and finding a new way to live our way. You can support female-founded businesses by looking out for the badges on our marketplace. In fact, we have lots of ways to shop by your values, from choosing black-owned businesses or socially positive businesses to products that are made of recycled material or made here in the UK. Find out more at Holly & Co. For now, though, let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. 
And so how did that then, was it the control that you had over your eating? Yeah. That was the comfort. Maybe you couldn't have control over pretty much everything else in your life. Well, I didn't have control over people's opinions of me. Yeah. I didn't have control over how they viewed what I was doing. And I didn't have control over the kind of decision not to talk about it. So I had, but I had control over what I ate. And I sort of wrongly assumed that if I looked the part more, you know, athletes are skinny, right? No, wrong. But if you, if I looked the part more and if I was leaner and fitter and faster and, you know, if I was winning running races, then I understand why I was training for running and why mm. I was swimming because not everybody makes the association between that cross training. And I was really winning running races. I was flying through all the regional cross countries. I was at English schools cross country alongside my swimming um you know, I was doing a marvellous job at two sports now and school work, but it wasn't making anything any easier at school. But it was a control thing very much. I had control over that and nobody else needed to know. And I could pretend I was eating and they didn't need to know I wasn't. And you had a wonderful GP that helped reframe yeah. thinking around food and turning the control from something negative into something positive. Would you mind telling me about that in case there are people listening? You know, I think... Uh, regardless, women, the pressures, lots of different stages, we try and get control over certain things to help us like a life raft get through yeah. what is ultimately, and you know, it carries on, doesn't it? Incredibly, um, a time where we're pulled in many directions. How did that GP help you refrain? No, she was she was marvellous. She looked at me and she said, it looks like you could do with a jam sandwich. <laughs> and I love jam sandwiches, I still do. I famously rode from John O'Groats to Land's End on jam sandwiches. So it was the right thing for her to say even before I ever got on a bicycle. But she said, the thing is, Sarah, is you want this career. You, you know, you're clearly a talented athlete, a hardworking athlete. And if you want to, you, you want your body to perform, you have to fuel it. And I knew that because we had nutritionists within the British setup. And I knew all of the things she was saying to me. But because she was outside of elite sport and she was the family doctor, the way she framed it and her tone, a bedside manner, I suppose you could say, she basically framed what I could lose if I didn't get mm. proper control. She said, you might feel like this is a control. You can control how what the, the weight on the scales might say. But if you have real control, then you're going to be able to use this fuel to make your body do more. And she said, if we write down what you're eating, let's have a look at it through the course of a week and we can decide together whether that's enough fuel for what you're asking of your body. She spoke about things like power to weight ratio and there will be a tipping point after which the power to weight ratio is not in your favour for anything. And then she also said, and if we can't get to grips with this, you'll have to be diagnosed with an eating disorder. And if you're diagnosed with that, we then have to put you through a process with the hospital to help heal you, to help you get over this in a way. And you'll require, you know, a series of treatment, yeah. sort of uh, psychological therapy to help me understand more. He said, once you're in that system, it can be hard to come out of it. So people spend their entire teenage years in a cycle of really negative behaviours and we don't want you to be diagnosed with anorexia. We want you to be fueled and performing for your country. And it was those words wow, because it was lady. that was the thing that got absolutely she's insanely good. And I remember thinking that she basically she'd hit the nugget because competing for your country, that's the bit that it gets me every time. It's like, oh yes, that's what I'm born to do. I can't risk that. And so the idea, and I guess throughout my career with the little blips I've had with health, whether it was my ear infections, whether it's chronic fatigue syndrome, whether it's, you know, head injuries and coming back from collapsed lungs and things. It's the, if you don't do this right, you won't compete for your country. Like that's the bit that you fear most, not being able to have a choice to do. And I think it's, it's incredible speaking to you because potentially we all don't have that thing. In a way, you had distilled your life's mission, the soul of you, you know, the, the living embodiment. Do you know what I mean? All the yeah. invisible force around you and you knew what it was. Yeah. And um, potentially that also saved you <laughs> by knowing what it was. And I, I think to anyone listening, what is your 
I'm not going to say the biggest word purpose because it freaks everyone out, but what is the diamond that you're going to bring to the world and that only you can do? And thank goodness for that woman. And and I know that subsequently you've helped other athletes with eating disorders with, with that advice. So after winning at Barcelona, you came home, you sat these GCSEs, you went to the first world championships, and then you sat your A-levels just before the game started in Atlanta in 1996. That must have been a huge amount to juggle, the training, education, and you were 19. So now you've got to sort of the end of childhood and you're still at it and you're still doing it. Had you become just quite a dab hand of being like a super child. <laughs> yeah, I mean, was, that's I was, all I can describe you as, because I'm just <laughs> literally going, we're only at 19. And what are you doing, doing this? It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, so I turned 19 just after the Games in Atlanta. And I think that summer, building up to the Games, obviously finishing year 13. And I knew that I could always reset my A-levels if I had to. <laughs> it wasn't been the ideal, but I knew I could. So I had already prioritized that swim training was non-negotiable. So I developed a technique where I would do as much of the rehearsal to my, you know, swatting up, you know, revising. That's why I can't think yep. of the word because I never did it. Revising in my <laughs> head. I would redo things in my head and I've developed almost like um, a photographic memory. So I would look at something for as long as possible in a lesson or I'd quite good at multitasking and doing work at the same time as doing other work and just kind of like... Being efficient with my time in school, uh, in college, as, as you might say. And I just became very good at kind of juggling a lot of things because I needed to not reduce my training hours because mm -hmm. I knew that if I didn't succeed in Atlanta, that could potentially affect my ability in the future because we'd just heard about national lottery funding and it was going to start after the Games in Atlanta. And I wanted to be part of that program. I wanted to have a, a path after university that enabled me to train, you know, at least partly full time for a while and have a choice of how often I trained. And I didn't want to have to go into a normal working line, nine to five, as it were. Yes. So I knew I needed to perform. So I guess you could, no one's ever said I was a super child, but I guess I just, th this overriding um, ambition to be successful for my sporting career, I guess I just learned to prioritise and I learned strategies that helped me to be as efficient as possible with as least amount of time. You sort of knew, it's like, you know, if you go into a meet, you know, you need to nail it because what rides on nailing it is so great that almost you can like the perform sliding on that doors. yeah it's those sliding doors like there's this this one chance you got to nail it so that the rest of my life is 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 how i i dream of it because you returned from atlanta and you were great britain's most successful athlete at the games and inevitably life started to change because you were settling in, in at uni appearing on tv you were obviously training you know as you train. And then came the games at Sydney and Athens, uh, where you won silver. And around this time, you were suffering, you just mentioned it, with chronic fatigue syndrome that went on for four years. You've spoken before about how this nearly ended your career. This must have been devastating. Yeah, so my decision to go to uni was based on a lot of research as to where I could successfully transfer my swimming training. And I chose a university with a really solid, um, tr very traditional town club, city club. And I spoke to the um, the head coach's team. He ha he was supposed to meet me, but he wasn't available. So I'd met with everyone and I'd gone over there and I'd done all my research. And when it got there, the, the head coach just refused to coach me. He didn't want me in the, in the, the, the first squad. He wanted me in a, a different squad where the training hours were really not conducive to the the, the best rest. So I'd be training from 8 till 10 p.m. at night and then be back in the pool at 5.15 in the morning. Can I ask why he didn't want someone with your credentials? He said he only coached athletes in the Olympic programme. Gosh. So immediately discarded anyone who wasn't in the Olympic programme. That meant the Paralympic programme was not the Olympic programme. It wasn't Olympic and Paralympic Games like we've had for so long. It was literally, you're not in the Olympic team. Right. Goodbye. So, and I spoke to other athletes and they said, yeah, we've had similar experiences. We don't, 
this person has made this decision you got no control over. So it's trying to find what I did have control over again because ultimately when mm-hmm. some people will make decisions and life's not fair, so you have to find a way to navigate through. But 19 years old, trying to coach yourself is hard. So the solution I came up with was that I spoke to the swimming pool and I negotiated some pool time. So I worked with my university to change around my timetable. And so I was coaching myself and it was... It wasn't the best thing to do as a 19-year-old. I didn't have anywhere near the level of experience I, mean, I do now. I mean, I coach myself even, now. I mean, how incredible that you even attempted that at 19. My son's 19. You know, they're st- you're just you're just grown-up children, yeah. Well, yeah. aren't you, at that bit? You know, it's not yet. You're not really. So that's an incredible... Um, again, you've just you, you've circumnavigated what was put in, you know, the obstacles put in front of you, and just found a way through. Go on, carry on with your story. Sorry, I, I just can't believe this is at nineteen. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess it was just this. I didn't want this to be the reason why I couldn't do something. And obviously, yes. the challenge with going to uni is you're navigating lots of other new things. So it eventually became sort of quite enormous how much I was trying to deal with. In my third year, I decided it was probably better to go back to training at home and to try and commute to university instead. And so that meant somebody else was taking care of the training load and I just had to worry about the travel. But that meant some insanely long days and lots of driving. And that was equally as difficult. Mm. The additional stress of the travel and the managing the workload was just too much, still too much. That, that wasn't yeah. that wasn't a better solution than trying to live in Leeds. So I sort of struggled my way through to the World Championships in 1998. And basically when I got to New Zealand, I couldn't do very much. But when I tried to go to sleep, I couldn't sleep. And when I did go to sleep, I'd wake up screaming. I felt as though I was paralysed to the bed. I couldn't use the lift because I used to fall over when I get out. My inner ear was completely messed up. Gosh. Um, And I did compete. I got two silvers and four bronze and I felt like a complete failure. And I got back from there And I went to the British Olympic Medical Centre and they assessed me. They did all sorts of um, heart assessments and they said, you know, you've got a severe post-viral fatigue. You've clearly had Epstein-Barr virus at some point, glandular fever, and you've got post-viral fatigue and that's basically presenting as chronic fatigue. They said, if you don't sort of rest and get this virus out of your system and you'll end up with heart condition and you'll never compete again. And so that was another, like, oh. Again. Like, wow. Mm-hmm. You, 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 I'm now listening. Yeah, you said something. <laughs> and I just thought that I wasn't performing because I was unfit. I thought it was my mm. poor plan for training. I thought it was, it was all my responsibility because I was doing the training plan, right? So I just assumed I wasn't doing enough and I did more. And that was obviously the worst thing I could have done. So I ended up on six weeks virtual bed rest, which was not ideal in the third year of uni. And... I just ended up having to start with five minutes a day. And that whole process taught me so, so much that I've, again, a bit like with the eating disorder, tried to support other athletes with. And we've heard a lot about post-viral fatigue with COVID. And I've worked with a lot of athletes who've suffered from post-viral fatigue after having had COVID. And being able to explain the the value in base, building up from almost zero, that experience is very powerful. And I've had to do it to myself a couple of yeah. times since then to ensure that I didn't sort of relapse, I suppose, and go to get to a point where a doctor might turn around and say, yeah, that's it. That's it. Because that is your word. Those are the worst words that could ever be used to you. And, and, and you've said that losing teaches you more than winning. And let's caveat this, you know, Losing being silvers and bronzes, which is obviously not losing, but this this idea that losing, and I think, you know, actually throughout all these interviews and people I've met, it's when we're on the floor, it's when we're crawling, it's when we have, um, we've lost it all. Uh, our ego, everything is just shattered, whatever it is, business decisions, any decision, and then what we did with that moment of opportunity, mm. how we had, how we looked at that moment as an opportunity, A, not to give up, yeah. you know, to succeed, to somehow see light and hope. And then what each day, how you build the steps. And I, I 
And, you know, we are very um, funny enough, different people, but I've always likened sports with business. I I, I feel like there is this, um, it, what you have to go through, you know, 10-year yeah. uh, overnight success, you know, all these sorts of things, the dedication mm -hmm. that what no one sees, what you, and only those moments that people do see. So tell me, in 2005, after persistent ear infections is that right so you, mm. you you go from do you go from one thing to another no you're you're now so you kept out of the water didn't you yeah so I got better from chronic fatigue and I came back to win the world champs in 2002 um, and then it was after Athens sorry I missed that bit yes. that's all right but I think what your point about I have said that you learn you learn more from losing what I also sort of added to that was it's the crucial lesson is making sure you learn as much when you're winning because it's very easy to take a step back and go ha ah, and not think is there a lesson here is there something i can take on and take forward that's interesting because if you're losing there's so many lessons and they're all dead obvious and they're smacking you in the face because you're on the floor and it's dead easy to get you um but when you're high those lessons run underneath you so fast and you've not spotted them. And I think it's really crucial that you recognise, and that helps keep you grounded, I think, mm. because you're not making the assumption that this is it. And maybe when you do make the assumption this is it, that's the time to stop. <laughs> but I think for me, you learn more when you lose. It's dead easy to learn more when you lose. Um, but yeah, so I came back after the games in Athens I went to Australia to get fit through the winter and when I got home from Australia I'd picked up an ear infection that basically kept coming and going for six months and I eventually got kept out of the water for what the doctors called an indefinite amount of time because they knew that if they threatened me with my career that was the only way they were going to get me to behave <laughs> um Completely different doctors, very astute, must have seen something in my eye. But I started to train on a bike because I made this decision that at 27 I was maybe too old to start running and um, I should not want to risk getting injured. So I started riding on a bike and then I started racing on a bike and then British Cycling had seen me down at the velodrome and said, would you like to see how fast you can go over over 12 laps, over 3,000 metres? I was like, yeah, yeah, I like doing things like that. So they trialed but me. But you didn't, you didn't, you weren't necessarily at that point thinking that this was going to be the pivot? No, no, no. I no. very much. So you were just like, yeah, yeah, I'll just give that a go. I'll give it a go. Go on. Yeah, I, I had I every do. intention. Uh, uh, Beijing, I had every intention of being in Beijing. We knew there was a Games in London because we'd just had it announced. So I raced 12 laps and I was shy of the world record by one second. <laughs> and everyone was sort of comparing stopwatches as if to say, as that just happened, and I stopped and went, was that all right? And they went, mm. <laughs> would you like to go to the European Championships next week? Wow. I was like, let me just check. I don't think I'm doing anything else. Why not? Can you imagine holding that stopwatch <laughs> and you just doing that? That must have been <laughs> one of, the, one of these right? moments in life that's never been repeated for them. And, of course, you then went on to win two gold medals in Beijing. Mm. And this is just incredible talk to me about this mindset that you have because to perform under that sort of pressure and to excel is there a difference of pressures as in that sort of tipping point between productive pressure and pressure that negatively affects your performance yeah definitely so the inverted u theory the sorry what inverted u so it's a graph and if you aren't um motivated enough or you're not uh you, you have you aren't under enough stress to perform you just don't perform to your optimum if you're under the right amount of stress you'll get the optimum performance that's and then at the top get, of the u yeah and if you get too much stress then the performance drops off again and that's on the other side of the u yeah so stress on the bottom and performance up the side and it's about how you frame this that, that stress or that pressure and external stress is something you don't have control over. So if you're thinking, oh, such a body's thinking about this and they're expecting that, then the chances are you'll quickly tip over the top of the U and be out of control, that, that you have not got control over other people's expectations. And you're only in control of what is 
the pressure you provide, mm-hmm. which ultimately should be the higher pressure because it's yes. about your intrinsic motivation. So for me, I'd always looked at it like that. And when I came into cycling, um, Dr. Steve Peters was the team psychologist and he's um, obviously written the, the Chimp Paradox and he's got his mind management tool. And he explained about the external pressure, the internal pressure, the difference between what you've set yourself to do and then how your mind can play tricks on you. Uh, and it all made complete sense. And I, sat, I remember being sat in a workshop with him in, in a hotel that we used out in Mallorca and thinking, that's it. That's exactly what I've been thinking. He's explained it perfectly. And it provided such clarity that I then didn't have to feel the pressure of anything other than my own expectation. So I did my race. I broke the world record by 12 seconds. <laughs> and the first thing I saw was a number one appear next to my name. So I'm like, have they made a mistake? Like, I couldn't believe it. And I was like, my hands go back on my face. And I'm like, shaking. And in the end, the confirmation appears. And I've won the race by 23 one hundredths. So 0.023. 23 one hundredths. And so not even a tenth of a second was between us. And I'm like, oh, that was a bit too close for call. And it was the most horrendous position to be in. But when you've been under that much stress, I don't think it's possible for it to get worse. Each week, I hand this ad break over to our partners at Royal Mail, who have been busy creating services to help small businesses. Now, if you're a founder selling on different platforms or through online stores, then integrating your accounts could save you time and money. And we all like to do that. Plus, it's fair to say that Royal Mail's parcel services have always been speedy. But now you can enjoy easy express parcel bookings too. So integrating your e-commerce accounts using click and drop means that your sales will be pulled through automatically, helping you to speed up all your parcel bookings. Just visit royalmail.com to find out more. Now back to this week's conversation of inspiration. I mean, this is something that you've obviously honed over the years and this as you said, external pressure, internal pressure. I mean, actually, none of us want your pressure that you put on yourself because I think that's probably, you know, if we had a competition across the globe, uh, <laughs> I, I don't want any of that bit because it, it, it sounds intense. And and talking of pressure, in 2012, the Paralympics were held, obviously, in London. And I remember speaking to Jessica Ennis about the 2012 Olympics and her image was everywhere, even on the flight path in London Heathrow. And we spoke about the emotional and mental resilience that you have to have to handle that level of pressure, to be able to channel it in a way that's not weighing you down and, it, you know, competing in your home country. What what was that like? And by the way, I've just been sitting on YouTube just watching you completely all the time and it's just the best thing ever to go back. <laughs> but what was that like competing? It was amazing. And I think we had to make a choice as athletes because we knew that it could be equally the biggest distraction ever we so we turned off our phones completely right. like we, we weren't phones weren't quite as dominant no. as perhaps they are today but we'd still do the same we'd maybe do it differently now because we've had we've learned coping mechanisms but phones and social media was relatively new so we turned them off we didn't look at social media we didn't look at newspapers i remember none of my family sent me any pictures of what they were seeing from the outside and afterwards when i looked back um, they had a picture from outside the tube station somewhere and it was a, a newspaper stand and every single newspaper had my face on the front cover. And I was like, thank God you didn't send me that. Um, but they all said, we just burst out laughing because we got off the tube and we're coming to watch you race and there you are, everywhere. Because yeah. that was after the first gold medal and my... Uh, my first gold medal was the very first of the whole team. I was refreshing my memory, as I said, and re-watching the moment and hearing the crowds and the roaring and the seeing the flags mm. flying and the screaming. Yeah. That moment, you know, we were so proud of you. Could you feel it? Yeah. Could you? Oh, definitely. Was it a life-affirming moment? It was an energy that you 
carried with you. So we created this bubble and the only time you ever sort of allowed yourself to look out of it was when you were in the stadiums because ultimately that's where the, the crowds were and 6,000 people in the velodrome. So you got a sense of the enormity of what was happening, but you didn't have any confirmation of that because you were quite quickly back inside the bubble. And one thing I'd rehearsed quite um, quite a lot, and I think this paid off in Tokyo, was that you had to be able to perform if you were in an empty room. Right, okay. So the, the press kept saying, how are you feeling about these big crowds? And I'd like, it's going to be just like training. You've got to be able to perform in an empty room. And no no one ever expected that we would need to because we had, ultimately we did in Tokyo. No one was there. Yeah. And we were in a full-on lockdown by the Paralympics. But in London, it was about blocking out and re focusing on the start gate or the start line on the road focusing on your bike, on your position of your pedals and on the position that you hold for the race, the corners on the road um, and all of the other markers that you have in a race that you've rehearsed in training. Mm. So those are the things you have control over. Those are the things that you've practiced. Yeah. And then once the games were over, I think I had three or four days after I finished my final race and I was in um, the gold BMW car that was ferrying me about London to different events <laughs> because I was the four gold medals and like <laughs> everyone was I felt like royalty at. it was the most bizarre and it was that then you could start to kind of try to comprehend what this, had, had you know enormous thing yeah. gone on it's just incredible and tell me about the prominence and awareness of para sport and whether you actually think it's changed in these recent years? Because I read that you said, I face the same problems as a woman and as a para-athlete too often. And you see the articles about women's bodies or their lifestyle rather than their athletic achievements. And I, I just thought that was very, very interesting. You said, if you can't see it, you can't be it. We need more coverage to harness the development of the para sport. It's got to be known. People must be able to see what is happening so people who are interested can enter the right pathway, whether they're male or female, able-bodied or a para-athlete. Do you think that now... Your cut, you know. Can I ask how old you are? I'm 46. Is this now something along with, and we're we're obviously going to talk about what you're you're training for, but is this something now that's very prominent in your life? Yeah, I think when I made those comments, I was trying to talk about the parallel journey because a lot of females will identify with the frustration of the the headlines being about how they look or what they're wearing versus what how they've performed. And in Paris sport for a long time, and it's getting less so, but it still creeps in. People talk about the the backstory, but the backstory is really just a, a pseudonym for talking about what's wrong with you. Mm -hmm. I remember thinking that this parallel was quite powerful because how do we bring people in when they, we've got a lot of people talking about the need to change the coverage of female sport, but when the entirety of para sport is in that same position, we therefore need to change it on both sides. And it's getting better, but we still struggle with coverage. We still struggle with the number of column inches. I think sport as a, an entity has grown yes. in terms of the amount of money that's within it. But the percentage that's owned by women's sport or by para sport has not changed. It's just that the stranglehold of the Premier League or the male sports has got bigger and the women's sport has got bigger. Yes. But it's it's all relative. Yeah. So it's still, the coverage is still struggling at around 2 or 3%. We still have the same challenges around losing uh, young talent in their fe female talent in their teenage years. We're placing undue pressure on people from such an early age. It you know, you have to develop quickly or you can't do it, you'll miss out. Yeah. And actually, some people develop a bit later in life. Some people start in one sport and move to another. And we haven't quite got this idea yet that we can share out that talent pool across all of the sports. Because if you were to speak to performance directors, they probably wouldn't say, oh, yeah, I think such a body might do well if they tried a different sport. They want Everyone wants to keep what they've got just in case that per person performs under their watch. And I think that's the challenge is making sure that we look at the individuals and their performances. But it's very stark in para sport and ultimately in female sport, how we, the share hasn't changed. It's still the same percentage. It's, uh, we won't go into it because we could do another hour talking about um, how women in business are 
too, you know, suffering. Yeah. You know, when we look at, I think, as I said, Melinda Gates was talking um, yesterday, and and it's a, a fact that I know that I think it's less than two percent of venture capital money goes to female founded businesses across the globe, right? So, what are these two percent, three percent doing in any of our vocabulary? Um, let me. We're coming towards the end, and I wanted just to finish off before I ask you your questions that I ask everybody at the end of the podcast. Um, the other passion in your life is your beautiful family and your husband. Barney and your two children, Louisa and Charlie. And I know they're very proud of you. And I read that it was Charlie, your youngest, that said he wanted to see his mummy compete at the Paralympics. So you're off to Paris. Hopefully. Um, and this is what all the training is about. Um, so once again, you are pushing these boundaries. You're an older athlete. Does that even compute? You know, I, I'm turning 47. I'm an older businesswoman. Like, what does it compute? I mean, it doesn't. In my book, you know, I'm I'm doing this forevermore. What about yourself? No, it does compute, but for the right reasons. I hope because I think this is a relatively untrodden path. There isn't that many athletes that have competed beyond their early 40s. Kristen Armstrong is the one that springs to mind for me because she's a cyclist. She competed in um, Rio. At nearly 43, I think she was 43 the following week and won a third consecutive gold in the road time trial. And so up until Tokyo, there was a kind of a parallel person who'd yes. done it about the same age. And for me, I was 43 because obviously the, the games were delayed. But now there isn't that. So this is sort of breaking new ground. So I think you have to respect that. Mm. And so you have to be aware that this isn't something that's a foregone conclusion. So selection will be made in the summer Getting to the start line is the first hurdle. And then obviously after that, the race results will be as they are. Um, and you're preparing to be the best you can be on that start line. And then the race is run to the best you can do on that particular day. Um, so for me, I'm very aware that I'm being chased by younger athletes in the same way I chased those older athletes when I was the young athlete. Yes. But I think one of the things I'm probably most proud of is the fact that I've managed to retain and stay ahead and adapt and move forward and continually improve and find ways to improve and, and be innovative with that. Yeah. And, you know, thank goodness. Thank goodness that you're doing this <laughs> because you've got your building legacy and you're the essence of a true role model, you know, one that we can be very, very proud of. And we need, you know, there's not many of us, you know, out there. I mean, us, I'm not putting you and I in the same uh, camp here, but I'm just saying this is such a vitally important thing that we do so that our girls, it changes for them. You know, these two, three percents of any industry of anything that we're doing um, changes. So we're coming to the end of this podcast. Now, your roller coaster journey, this is what I end with, which is that the journey that you've taken is like a roller coaster. You've had these, I mean, almost like not, none of, not hardly anyone on the planet has your highs and probably your lows. But what would you say, if you had to say what was your biggest low so far, what would you say it's been? It's oh the, the biggest low, probably the most recent big low is was in 2022 when I was taken out in a crash. I was in the right position, but the person in front of me chose to do something quite reckless. And I ended up crashing out of that particular race, head injury, broken ribs, and the broken ribs led to a partially collapsed lung. And then I had sort of struggled through world championships uh, 12 weeks later and then I ended up with a series of illness a series of illness that really wiped me out and I wondered if my career would end because I didn't know if I would ever be able to come back from my such goodness. an issue that I had and obviously I was 45 so there was all that against me age wise so I think for me that was probably the biggest low and the, and then having to build back up from zero. So I remember being out here um, in this exact spot, having to start with just a 30 minute really easy ride to see if I could actually ride the bike because I'd had such horrendous chest infection that um, I'd been in A&E struggling to breathe and nearly admitted. So I think for me, that's probably one of my biggest lows. It's hard to choose between that one and obviously the state I was in when I had chronic fatigue. I just can't even just compute how you're going from there to here in in these periods of time. And I'm really going to reflect on the words that you've been saying to us on this podcast, because 
you've got some magic sauce that you're doing because you keep coming back. And um, I want some of that, um, but I'm not going to be getting on any bike anytime soon. Tell me about the high. Tell me about what you think is your moment. Um, I think it's probably it's probably winning that 17th gold medal. But the, the the high point of that win was being able to get out of the airport to see the kids and Barney because I'd had to do it. I mean, I had the support of the team and some incredible people who've been with me for a long time on the journey. The doctor I mentioned earlier, um, who was our chief medical officer, he's now the chair of British Paralympic Association. He's known me since I was a teenager and he was there. My very first chef to mission, he'd made a beeline to be there. So many people had prioritised oh their schedule goodness. on that day to be with me. But it kind of felt like it was a very elongated high because I'd achieved this, like the previous... Uh, most gold medals had been won in 1988. So it was a long time to beat this record. And I hadn't even started competing in, <laughs> at that point. So, um, but I, I had straight from the race to the airport and then straight on a plane and straight home as fast as I possibly could. I couldn't have got home any quicker to see the kids. And that first, it was on Instagram, that first run to realise mum was actually home 22 nights, which had felt like an eternity for three year old Charlie. And that was the biggest sort of high. It's like, wow, it doesn't really matter what the decision is now. I'm home. I've done it. We've got three gold medals. I've got that 17th. It's like, yes. Gosh, I don't think you're ever going to stop. It's amazing. Your beautiful spirit, you have prepared a letter to your younger self. And I don't yeah. know what you're going to say. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I'm in awe of you already. And I, I just want to say thank you, Sarah, for sharing all that you have with us today. Can I hand over to you? Yep, you can. And I'm going to try and make it big enough to read. <laughs> <laughs> That's age for you. <laughs> okay. Dear Sarah, keep up the good work. You are doing just fine. As tough as it is to hear, those bullies aren't going to define you. But mum, dad and the teachers are right. Your sporting career is going to last a whole lot longer. Remember that calculation you did to see how old you'd be after competing in eight games? Do it again. Only this time, count up to nine. Sounds mad, right? But honestly, your work ethic, dedication to always improving yourself and your open-mindedness for never being afraid to try new things, those traits will take you far. What you don't believe is that swimming won't always be your first love. What it will teach you and shape you to be an even greater athlete and leader. You'll regularly meet complacent people who don't give you the attention and support you deserve. And unfortunately, there's not a great deal you can do about them. But you will get better at recognising who those people are. I know it's been hard to lose Alistair as your coach, but he is always going to keep a keen eye on your sporting journey. By the time you reach your 30s, you will have built a team of trusted advisors that you can add to and liaise with to bring out the very best in yourself. To reach that point, you'll make mistakes and learn how to build yourself back up. Every hurdle will make you stronger and give you a better understanding of your own limits. I know you want to stay at the top of your sport for as long as you possibly can. You'll face people attempting to make decisions on when your sporting journey should end, but don't let them deter you. Perhaps the most difficult thing to explain will be that you'll end up being most proud of your resilience, versatility and adaptability. It won't just be those medals. It's probably as a result of that no stone unturned approach you have and always have been so solutions driven. That will never leave you. And it's crucial to you being able to keep improving and stay relevant as an athlete. The world will be an unrecognisable place once the digital age really takes hold. It's hard to explain what this will bring, but you will embrace the change and move with the times to ensure that you continue to grasp hold of and maximise every opportunity. Never be afraid to try something new. I won't give too much away, but that curiosity and love of all sport is going to be the best thing you could have ever imagined. Hold your head up high. And smile. <laughs> Yay! You are just amazing. You're just a beacon of inspiration. This is conversations of inspiration and you are epitomise it. And your story, your challenges, your grace, your determination, it is, I want to put it in the breakfast of all young girls, <laughs> you know, and I just want to say, look what can be achieved through anything that we face 
we can do it. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, Sarah, for speaking to us today. I wish you everything. We are right behind you. And long may you and your determination continue. So thank you so much for your just beautifulness today. Oh, thank you, Holly. That's so kind. Thank you. It's been great to speak to you. Thank you for joining me today. If you've enjoyed this episode, can I ask that you share it with a friend and like, subscribe and review it too, so that together we can inspire even more people to follow their dreams, to build a life they love. Mm -hmm.